Hi, this is Rob Kelly, and this short PowerPoint video uh, is entitled It's Not About the Past. Over the next couple of weeks, there is going to be a, a small addition to all of the Thrive books somewhere during the somewhere in the locus of control section just entitled it's not about the past because people are still coming through thrive and, and your average joe blogs on the street really does believe that their past has a significant influence over the way they think and the way they feel now and the honest answer is it's just not true okay so let's have a look people often believe that the past has significant impact upon them today for example fixing their personality or forming their self-esteem. We know that when everyone comes through Thrive and we talk about the marbles or we talk about the self-esteem battery, people always relate their self-esteem to their past. They, they relate it to events in their childhood when they're growing up, events that they think had a significant impact upon their self-esteem. Individuals frequently think the particular past event is causing their symptoms or problems today. As you know, I believe this for many years. They believe that past difficult or traumatic memories still have power over them and that they're responsible for the negative emotions they experience currently. As I just said, none of this is actually true. A traumatic event may have reinforced or influenced the formation of some limiting beliefs and thinking styles, which the person still holds today, which are consequently affecting him or her in a negative manner. Additionally, the person may be brooding about the event, creating negative emotions about it in the present moment. But the event itself, or the memory of the event, isn't the important factor in a person's distress right now. It's their beliefs and their thinking now that matter. It's their beliefs and their thinking in the present time that have the effect. Let's have a very quick look again at memory. Memory is entirely constructive. It's entirely constructive. If you ask most people to think back to their wedding day or a significant event in the past, they'll get this video-like thing playing in their mind, and they genuinely believe it. They've stored this video of the event, and it's just a question of finding the tape in their storage department in the back of their brain, which pertains to this particular event. But it doesn't work like that at all. We do not store a videotape of events in our brain. We do not store a video anywhere in our brain of any experience. Memory is a reconstruction. We piece together different pieces of information when we recall an event. In, in fact, it's very, very likely that the bits we actually store at a very, very tiny uh, um, neuron level are tiny, tiny microscopic bits of electrical energy that obviously look nothing like the, the full-blown visual video that we watch in our mind when we remember, for example, our wedding, or, uh, or both of them if you've had two. No one neuron in the brain contains all the information needed to reconstruct a memory. Lots of neural networks in different areas of the brain are activated. Oshner and Schachter, 2000, stated that cognitive psychology and neuroscience have impressively demonstrated that memory is an active process that involves interpretation and construction at all stages. So what we might have, we might have at this neuron level, and tiny, tiny electrical impulses at neuron level, that kind of contain a blueprint of a memory, that might say, you know, uh, at the weekend I played tennis with Justin, it was cold, I won. And from that little bit of knowledge, I recreate the whole experience of being there, being with him, thrashing his ass at tennis, uh, what the weather was like, how we felt, what we were wearing, what we talked about, who else we bumped into. I fill in all these little gaps. I, I construct this, if you like, this jigsaw puzzle of the event. If we think of memory as a jigsaw puzzle, we can think of constructing a memory or, or, or a video, if you like, that we believe we're replaying, as rather like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle. Some information was encoded at the time of the event, and when remembering something, we're likely to access some of this information, though not necessarily all of it, to put it back together. 
But distortions, alterations and additions can often also occur when memory is being constructed. Basically, we often also add other pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. The puzzle is therefore unlikely to be a completely accurate representation of the original event. Even more significantly, a person's emotional experience of the event can be radically different to when it originally occurred. Lots of factors affect the way in which we piece together the puzzle and how we experience a recalled event. A person's beliefs and expectations affect recall. A person may have on a pair of shit-tinted spectacles, which distort the way in which they recall an event. Or maybe they have on a pair of rose-tinted spectacles when they remember their son or their daughter's wedding, or the birth of their grandchild. They may, for example, only remember the negative aspects of a particular holiday, or they might remember an illness as being more severe and debilitating than it really was. We know, for example, all the research around uh, fear of flying, and particularly emetophobia as well. We know that a person's autobiographical memory is totally different than their actual fear. It's a completely different level of experience altogether. People can apply scripts to help them quickly make sense of a particular recollection. Scripts represent general beliefs about what typically happens during a particular event, i.e. what normally happens in a restaurant. Go back to my game of tennis, I've played tennis lots. All I need to remember was roughly what day I played and who I played against, and the script fills in the details. I know kind of what court I'll be on, I know kind of what clothes I'll be wearing, I know kind of what racket I'll be using, I kind of know how I'll be feeling, I'll kind of know the temperature in the place, the walk through the hallway, getting changed before, a little bit of banter, coming out afterwards, probably having a pint. That happens almost every time I go and play tennis. So those details easily just get filled in. Those, those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle automatically get added. I don't do it consciously. I don't know that I'm doing it, <clears throat> but these things happen. Scripts help us to filter, organize, and process information quickly and efficiently. But remembering an event can be distorted when the actual experience does not fit the script. script. A person may fill in or change details of the event to fit their script of what normally happens. A person's current emotional state can influence the way they recall or the way they um, uh, construct this memory. For example, one study found that people currently experiencing high levels of headache pain tended to recall the past headaches as having been more severe than they actually rated them at the time. People's current goals and desires can alter their memory. Oshner and Schachter again have highlighted that constructive recall of effective events may at times be led by the desire to remember the emotional past in a way that helps create a particular view of the self in the present. We know, for example, that people that have a lot of learned helplessness or what we unfairly used to call victimology always used to view their past events in a very victim-like way, assuming these events had a traumatic uh, impact upon them, assuming these events were devastating, assuming these events were done to them. It's also about sometimes not taking responsibility. If horrible things have happened to a person in the past causing their problems, then it's not their fault in the present day. It's not my fault in the present day if I can't run because I broke my leg when I played football when I was seven. And it helps me manage my social anxiety. Finally, remember that emotions are not bottled up. We do not bottle up emotions. There is no evidence anywhere in the world to suggest that people actually do bottle things up. I know I used to talk about it as a good metaphor for hypnoanalysis. People had bottled up emotions and these needed to be released. But actually, it's not true at all. We always create emotions in the present moment. All emotions are created in the present, in the now. Oshner and Schachter again have stated, our initial interpretation of a given event's emotional significance 
need not be the last one we ever have and we, how we encode it initially need not determine how we react to it at all. We know that even with the death of a loved one, people react differently to the different stages of that. It's not that I've got all this emotion needing to come up and needing to be expunged or resolved. When I think of the uh, loved one who's passed away, depending on what stage of that process I'm at, depends how I'm going to react. If I miss them, I'm going to react in the most way. If I don't, I'm not going to. We know from other studies that people who are going through the process of getting over a loved one, who find out a new piece of information, for example, maybe they were having an affair, maybe they were adopted, their process changes significantly. All emotions are created in the present moment. Nothing's bottled up. Everything is created in the now by the way you look back at something, by the way, the way you react to something. This is why it's, it's comparatively easy for someone like Mary to get over hugely pathological fear of being sick after suffering it for 75 years. It doesn't matter whether she's had it for 75 years or three years. It's how you deal with it. We also know that resilience in childhood has a hugely important uh, part to play on how someone deals with something like abuse or abusive experiences. The resilient child bounces back. He doesn't view them. They don't experience them the same way as someone with a certain amount of learned helplessness and victimology. So it's all about now. It's all about the present moment. The power is always in the now. It's almost irrelevant what happened in the past if you can create the skills and resources in the present to deal with these things, to manage them, and to create beliefs and thinking styles that really help you to have a happy and uh, prosperous future. Thanks for watching.